Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, from the excitement that I've been seeing on the chat and on the Twitter, uh, looks like there's a lot of learning, a lot of uh, um, interesting pieces of information that seem to be resonating with many of you all. Uh, great to have you all again. Um, so today we're going to have uh, talking about shaping the nation for uh, uh, women entrepreneurs. We'll have, we have Professor Hema with us and uh, Megha. We, we will have uh, Raman and is probably running late. Is going to join and when he joins, he will uh, uh, join the panel. So here's what we thought we will do. We make it very conversational, very informal, but given the vast experience that each of our uh, panelists have, I would be inviting each of them to give their opening remarks for about 10 minutes. Then um, I'll ask some questions and have the panel also ask each other questions before opening up questions uh, from the uh, audience. So um, first we will have uh, Hema go. So Hema, uh, welcome. Uh, Mr. Raman, sir, we just about started. Uh, um, so, Hema, yeah, would uh, yes. you go ahead and... Uh... Sure, sure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suresh and the NSR cell team for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Um, well, I'm going to talk very broadly, not so much focusing on entrepreneurship, but more broadly about women and opportunities for economic empowerment. That's really sort of my area of research, right? So I'm going to bring a slightly more academic angle to this. And as and when I can, I'm going to draw the entrepreneurship links. And uh, given that this is my area of work, I might just go on. So Suresh, do chop me off. Uh, and then <laughs> I'm used to 90 minute lectures, not 10 minute panels. Uh, so then uh, just give me a cue. Right. Um, and I want to be a little provocative um, and hope that this will also be an opportunity for us to um, for you to ask me questions and I think help take the conversation forward. Right. So the way I've kind of I want to structure my opening remarks is that I want to talk about, I think, one of the main sort of challenges that women face in the economic realm is about patriarchal social norms. And I'm going to tie that to labor market. And I'm going to tie that to government interventions, right? So I, I'll leave the labor market and government interventions um, as I talk about these norms. And the norms also broadly, I want to classify them into sort of uh, three aspects. One is social norms that really dictate what men and women do, how, what the kinds of gender roles and gender stereotypes that are expected. Then I want to talk about uh, factors that constrain women's mobility. And then I want to touch upon very briefly, um, women's access to finance and autonomy regarding financial decisions, right? And in my mind, uh, these three um, are very important for economic empowerment and thereby also they link quite nicely to entrepreneurial roles uh, that men and women have and well, particularly for women, right? So let me I mean, what is our expectation of men and women in society, right? Very gendered. You, man walks in, woman walks in, we've already made a whole lot of assumptions uh, about what they do, what they can't do, et cetera. So, right, to look at some data. So, in 2019, we did a time use survey in India. The NSSO did a nationally representative time use after a very long time. And very stark findings. We all know that, of course, that women's labor market in India is very low. It's somewhere in the 20%. Uh, very stark for a country that has seen close to double digit growth for almost a decade, right? And you hear a lot about uh, what we are losing our demographic dividends, blah, 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 McKinsey reports and all of it, right? But if you look at the time use and what it found is that 94% of women are doing unpaid work, right? Which is housework, childcare, domestic work, all of it. It's only about 20% of that for men. In the day, on average, women spend 388 minutes doing unpaid work, whereas men spend 151 minutes, right? And why is this important, right? It's important because there's a double burden of care on women, right? They can perform well in the paid labor market only if the unpaid work also starts getting distributed at home. Now, this is a social norm. 
that we really have to address. You can't keep saying women have to participate in the labor market when you're not saying men have to participate at home, right? So where is that uh, thread of work? Uh, where is that messaging? I see that absent. It's only about women have to go out and work. It's as if, you know, women are sitting at home doing kitty parties, right? It's not. They are actually doing, there's an invisibilization of women's work. So the labor market, so, and why is this important in terms of thinking about the labor market, right? Because the labor market is not a neutral institution as economists would like to believe, right? It is very gendered. When you're interviewing a woman candidate, you're thinking, oh, is she of a marriageable age? Oh, then is she going to move? Oh, maybe she's going to have a child. And then what do I do, right? So there is what is called very stark motherhood penalty. That's across the world. You have a motherhood penalty because you lose out on wages, you lose out on career, uh, there are career gaps. I mean, there are ways and means of getting around it, right? But the basic fact remains that women need not have a motherhood penalty beyond the fact that there is a biological need for you to recover after having a child, right? Apart from that, there's nothing that says that men can't take care. So when we talk about government legislations, we have a six month maternity benefit, nothing for paternity except 15 days. So you're reinforcing certain messages, right? Make it equally costly for a company to hire a man as much as it is for a woman. Then you will see gender effects going away. Now the six month maternity benefit, which is not backed by government resources, is really hurting companies. Forget the Googles of the world who bring in different kinds of, uh, they bring in different kinds of messages, right? Look at the small and medium companies. Why are they going to hire a woman? They're not, right? Because to hire a man, they don't have to do anything. To hire a woman, it's harder, right? So this childcare that you associate with a woman, that has to change, right? Uh, then we have, so that's sort of what the government can do. So this is a very uh, strong social norm that I think we need to think about. Then um, safety is a very big issue in our country, right? Um, and that is also held against women, right? Oh, don't go there. Don't take the bus. Don't do this, right? Well, some of it is, I think you use safety as an excuse because there are also issues of purity and pollution and women's honor, all of that that is tied up, right? So you use this as a mechanism to limit exposure and mobility, access to market, all of which is very important for women, so especially if you're thinking of entrepreneurs. I mean, an entrepreneur is also someone who's selling vegetables in the market, right? Or who's weaving and taking stuff to the market, but she might not be able to access the best place where she gets the maximum exposure because it's a very male dominated space. And you're saying, oh, you can't go there, right? But to make it all accessible, you also have to address the culture of this hyper toxic mas masculinity that we see, right? Nobody is saying that men and boys have to tone down, right? Uh, stop, stop movies that normalize stalking, stop movies that normalize eve teasing, um, following up on women and not saying a no actually means a yes, right? Stop saying all of that. So the messaging is, I think, very skewed, right? It's only about restricting women's movement. And this actually has very implica strong implications. There's a lot of evidence based from India and abroad that based on the kinds of uh, safety mechanism, access to safe public transport, women are making career choices that might not be the most uh, successful for them. Or the study in Delhi showed that girls were actually making um, choices of colleges based on uh, distance from home and based on access to metro stations, right? The metro actually has been great for women. So actually, if you find uh, women's employment, there's a boost with availability of metro, right? So public transport, safe public transport, lighting, all of that is very important for women. It actually impacts career, it impacts education, it impacts employment. And the fact that you restrict mobility also means you don't have access to networks right? You don't, you're not able to meet a lot of people. Um, and then with networks, there's also peer learning, right? There is mentoring. So there is, you're missing out on all of these because of these kinds of norms, right? And then um, I also want to talk about access to finance, right? Um, some of this will impact 
your access to finance the mindset of women walking into a formal sector bank a she needs to have the agency to be able to do all of that b the bank manager very likely a man needs to recognize the fact that she is got her business proposition is great and that it's going to work just as well right um, so you know i mean it's these stereotypes are not i mean often when people talk about gender and stereotypes you say oh no no i don't believe in stereotypes but that's not true there's a lot of implicit bias and a very famous example of this was in the new york um a symphony they found that all the people who were part of the orchestra were mostly men they were like what happened can women play so then they introduced this a system of blind screening so that the ju- jury is going to be just listening to the music they are not going to be seeing who is walking in and who's playing and guess what the number of women selected into the orchestra went up and this is a very old example but i find it very powerful right it's like you are only listening to the product you are not listening to anything else right but the minute you see a woman walking in you've already uh, well uh, sort of made certain assumptions so you've seen right and and we are guilty of it so i'm saying that i think these are some of the factors that really constrain right um so when the, so the labor market i guess the point i'm trying to say is that the labor market is a very gendered institution currently it's male dominated that really has to change right um i think companies all of it i mean there are some good moves that are happening but in my mind it doesn't go far enough because you are just being very superficial when you say that uh, you're going to try and hire more women but i think a lot of us we've got to also start changing conversations about what is it that men can do uh, i think a lot of factors that are trying to address women's empowerment are directed at women as if they are the binding constraint i think the ma- binding constraint is also the men right so they need to be part of the conversation um to understand that and and the patriarchal mindset so it's also older women i mean it's not as if women are women's best friends um there are also generational differences that i think we need to um adjust for right and then the labor market in another way is also hyper masculine because networking is a minute a minute uh, that's it okay <laughs> We'll let you speak. We'll let you speak, Jawan. Like very interesting. Well, maybe you can take a couple of more minutes. No, no. Just give me two more minutes. Happy your thoughts. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this whole thing about networking events happening on weekends, meetings called beyond five o'clock, it's just bogus, right? I mean, that assumes that the man can come because someone is there to look after the children and make sure dinner is ready when you go back home, right? So a lot of women. opt out then in fact even an imb when meetings used to be called beyond 5 o'clock i used to opt out saying that keep the crash open till 7 otherwise i'm not going to come to the meeting right i've got other things to do so actually women are reducing i mean are reducing their career opportunities because they are focusing on raising the next generation's labor so the labor market thinks that labor is free no it's actually coming at the cost of someone else's choices right you've got to respect those choices and you've got to change the narrative again meetings that happen beyond 7 o'clock on weekends it's just hyper masculine change the narrative this can't work right um, in fact yeah well never mind i won't talk about this panel happening on a saturday but <laughs> <laughs> um so then access to finance and uh, i think uh, it's it's about property it's about collateral it's about gender stereotypes right do women really own property um there was a study that i did where i was looking at very detailed individual level property ownership in karnataka and the only women who tend to own property are widows so we were joking that you know your husband really has to be dead for you to be able to own property you don't get it from natal we've got sort of legislations around it but i mean what can you do now to increase access to property so that it can be a source of capital it can be collateral i mean everybody knows about hernando de soto's uh, dead capital approach right so how can we empower them and this empowerment is important also for women to have financial autonomy to be able to increase her status within the household often i find that trainings and grants that are given to women think those are the binding constraints they think the women lacks access to capital or she doesn't know how to do a business plan that's not it maybe if you give her that could be necessary but it's not sufficient if you give her money 
maybe it's being diverted maybe the husband in the house is taking it for his business right so we don't know those dynamics so i think we've got to start sort of thinking about it as a whole uh, okay suresh i'll stop there <laughs> i don't want to cut into too much time um so um well well uh, hema you hardly been provoked to you actually laid the facts down uh, so these are stated how the gravity is because we always keep saying that the gravity for women to start ventures is not the same as it is for men but you kind of unpack what we broadly say as gravity to say that these are the ways in which barriers come up um sometimes because they have not been thinking very carefully uh the example that i can give you is nsr cell was the only incubator that would allow kids to run around um so there were women who would refuse to go out because you know what there's no other place that i can take my kids to because this is the only incubator where i can bring people in right to the extent uh i don't know if i should say this but we have let kids into the class as well in uh so 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 but that's great yeah. this, okay. i think that's a great move <laughs> yeah so uh, we just didn't want to say that because i don't know how it, was, it but but there is a lot that needs to be done really a lot needs to be done i think that's a very good um, what i would say take off but um uh, i'm sure um uh, mega will have interesting things to talk about but um mega broadly we could have this conversation late, uh, later to respond to some of the things that hema said that hema said but uh, what it would be good if you could talk about some of the things that you are doing and also about the research that you have been working in terms of capital. yeah no absolutely but before that hema i thought that was just that was absolutely phenomenal to to hear you say that and i'm glad you started with it because um i think there is broad agreement but we need to be constantly reminded we need to open up with the with the real issues rather than you know try and optimize on the margins right the real issues are the social permission to work there is you know i'm going to start by corroborating that i think there is a very misleading dialogue around choice that it is my choice to not work my wife made the choice to take care of the children you know when 80% of women uh, 80% women of working age are not working that's an illusion of choice right that is not choice you've sort of over over time i'll go so far as to say you've been gaslighted to believing that's a choice it's not a choice um i think there is you know when i when i look at overall the story i'll before before i talk about what we're doing i so, uh, professor bagwatul i also did want to add that i'm the only one the only one in my leadership team who regularly brings my daughters to work um it's wonderful i think it's a, a you know and it's it's uh, it's almost like i'm the only person who has a child right <laughs> everybody has has children too but i think how come i'm the only one who's bringing them but um but yeah it has to get normalized and it has to the infrastructure has to keep pace with it and i'm still talking from you know in quote and quote an ivory tower if i have to be honest right i still have the facility in my office to get get you know um, sup my you know my Uh, daughter's nanny along or you know there's someone who will be watching over here but the infrastructural gaps are you know i mean they are they are unforgiving right they are unforgiving whether i think hema spoke about mobility she spoke about the social permission to work um about safety about toilets right like i'm i'm not talking about startups and tech tech startups where you know you still have co working spaces which are built on modern lines i'm talking about and this is going beyond entrepreneurship but i'm talking about every time uber makes the effort to bring in women drivers guess what the challenge they run into which is a woman driver has to go has to have equal access to toilets while she's driving right it's not the same for women than it is for men so there's some very real challenges that come into the mix um i you know and i uh, him i'm i'm really happy you started with those because i think that's important to ground us all i'll talk a little bit about the research we did and i the reason i'm talking about it is i think just staring at some of those numbers is very powerful um hema you mentioned the labor force participation rate right uh, i think it's 20% you look at rural versus urban urban is lower than rural then you look at different age groups we want in that number and we know that that 80% that's not in the workforce is working very hard and right? they're working they're working all day they're just not in paid work which is very unfortunate let me talk a little bit about the 20% that's there in the workforce as well unemployment rate for women is higher than it is for men 
let's be clear about that if you look at urban women graduates two years back when i looked at the those numbers and then i saw some numbers from about six months back two years back that number was three and a half x for women uh, versus men uh, when i checked them you know for about six months back they were about 1.52x right so even those who are participating in the workforce see higher unemployment and you know at the same time let me bring about what happened in covid right uh, hema you spoke about several issues every time the schools decide to shut whether it's because of covid or because of air quality guess who feels the punch in the gut first i tell you i feel it and i'm sitting in an ivory tower which i fully acknowledge i feel it every time i feel like oh my god i just signed up for a new client how am i going to do it right should i be feeling that way should i be sharing that load of course but the point is should that situation arise no right we i mean it's not it's in you know it's not just about sharing the load it's also about that is the infrastructure we're talking about now what is the result of all of this hema mentioned the demographic dividends i won't you know and and i know the context in which you mentioned that hema i wouldn't i wouldn't yet call it a dividend because it's not a dividend unless you're able to get you know get the economic and social returns from it doing nothing with what we with the labor force participation we have today by 2030 we will have 400 million women of working age who will not have a paid who will not be in paid employment right there's about 90 million today or 80 million today who are in paid employment and that you know if i look at total there are about 400 430 million of working age 340 million of them are not in paid work right of that but 320 million are not participating in the workforce and the 20 million are participating but are not employed this number goes up there will be 400 million women of working age now to me that just feels like you know of course job creation is important but to me that's a colossal waste that's a colossal waste of human life right because there is intelligence there is potential right and of course there is a huge economic and social return from this hence when we when i looked at entrepreneurship the objective was not to you know entrepreneurship is hard let's be clear about it right but it but we are not in a situation of either or we are not in a situation saying you you need to create job you need to create job but you actually the, you we have to recognize that there is a huge part of the population of india for which entrepreneurship may actually be a much more achievable option just because of how india is set up and when i talk about entrepreneurship i'm not talking about tech startups i'm talking about the woman who can actually create pickles and sell them in her local market i'm talking about the woman who can actually create cast iron cookware but more the woman who runs a chc in a village right to me who takes on the franchise of a chc to me that's an entrepreneur as well but that opportunity is you know we're all seeing it where when i look at the world right now i'm going to take a slightly more i won't call it nationalistic view but if i take an india view right when i look at the world in the next 80 years we're going to have too few people india is going to have the most people of working age we have to capitalize we have to and and india has a has an advantage in some ways where there is a very deep engineering mindset right which seems to be you know something which will be a lot of a lot more significance as we look at the next few years how do we create this to me entrepreneurship is an absolutely critical element of this right to me women have have the potential they have they have the will they have the choice um there needs to be an enabling environment there needs to be recognition of the fact that it is you know entrepreneurship is not one big term it takes very different forms and that entrepreneurship in my belief in my view can actually create jobs for themselves and and help elevate the role of women not just into people who are generating their own income which you know honestly is was due 50 years back but are also creating jobs so when we did the research you know we said okay look if we take up the quality and quan and we did some an analysis over here right it, it can be and we didn't make a prediction as much as we tried to see what could be the potential here <clears throat> we said okay from whatever 15 to 20% Uh, today which is women owned enterprises if that goes up to 30 to 35% and you're also improve the quality there is opportunity to create over 150 million new jobs right now look the numbers are numbers we can all debate what assumptions and all are made the point of putting numbers around it was to say look this is not small we're not talking small stuff we're talking big stuff and we're leaving all of that behind right and then beyond jobs let me just talk a little bit about what is the other effect what what we saw and you know in the last two years i've spoken with over 
um, women business owners in various stages of their business. And every time I learn more because I'm not a business owner. I'm a, you know, I'm a cheerleader um, on, the, on the sideline. One is just the individual outcomes. Uh, you know, and I'll share some anecdotes. Professor, you told us we can keep this conversational. Right? There is, of course, the confidence and the control that a woman has over her life, right? I'll tell you, I've seen women make some incredible decisions. Several women I spoke to said, look, as soon as my business started to have green shoots, my family started supporting me. <clears throat> but there was a non-trivial number of women who said, look, I achieved the, the confidence to turn away from people who were not supporting me. I left a bad marriage because I had suddenly, I had, I, you know, I had a mission. I had my children. I had the confidence that I could, I could do this. Social outcomes, right? I won't talk about this. You know, there's a piece of research where no one knows the author, which says better outcomes on health and education if women have control over finances. I don't know who the author of it is, but I did find some credible research which said that, you know, the more the economic prosperity for women, the lower their fertility rates, the better their health and the better the education for themselves and their families, right? And their families. And then the third is, look, something has to be said about innovation over here. At the end of the day, a lot of the gender responsive innovation that many of us are experiencing day to day, right, has been led by women. Whether it's eco-friendly sanitary napkins in urban India or low-cost sanitary napkins in rural India, there are women who are making those, right? I mean, I've not seen, I've, I've, I've seen only women come up with healthy, non-processed foods for children. <laughs> Guess what? That's the next generation, right? So, I mean, there are the benefits are there for all to, you know, for, for all to see. And unfortunately, it doesn't get the same footage and the same um, airtime as well, as, you know, sort of well-funded startups taking nothing away from those, right? But I'm saying there is a whole economy that is uh, that is germinating that has germinated which requires its due right my last point before i stop here would be you know i'm talking about women's entrepreneurship i'm very i'm guilty of using that term which i know is you know some folk it's not you know it, it's a term we use i wish we didn't have to use the reason we use the term women's entrepreneurship as a catch-all is to amplify and draw attention to an area, but at the end of the day, there are multiple segments, types of entrepreneurs. It cannot be the same. You, you can't run it with the same brush. There are tech startups. There are small business owners, rural and urban India. There are solopreneurs. There are, there are resellers, you know, who are earning 10,000 rupees a month by selling on Misho. Great, right? There are agripreneurs. We, we need to think about it, you know, comprehensively, but within each bucket, think about they're very different solutions. There's no one standard uh, charter here. I'll stop over there. Um, Professor Bhagwatullah, I'll talk more about our work in the conversation, but I've gone over time. You on mute, Professor. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Mega. Perhaps, perhaps um, we could also unpack this construct, be professional, and look at a gender aspect of being professional in the sense that you shouldn't be doing a lot of things because that's not professional, right? So who defines what is professional? And it does hurt in terms of uh, uh, women not being able to say things because you know what would maybe seem as unprofessional. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe as uh, Hema said, turning up on a Saturday uh, or uh, going to a remote place or whatever, in the sense that working late nights. And uh, uh, there is a lot, lot that needs to change in order to create a much more enabling environment for women in the sense that the road is too long, uh, but I'm sure there are some green shoots uh, uh, all over, um, uh, not just at NSRSL, although we've been uh, working with women entrepreneurs. As you rightly said, we should probably, a lot of times I stopped saying women entrepreneurs, I just say entrepreneurs, but, but at, at some point you need to continue to use that uh, construct just to um, signal. But in any case, um, uh, Mr. Ramnan, over the last so many years, uh, you have been instrumental in taking entrepreneurship to large parts of the country. Uh, maybe connecting, weaving your narrative into what uh, Hema and uh, Mega had said, in addition to some of the things that you have been working on over the last uh, so many years that you have been uh, mission head for Atal Innovation Mission, right? And uh, the Atal Innovation Labs that you all have uh, started across the country, including uh, rural areas, right? 
So, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Suresh, uh, for giving me an opportunity to participate in this, uh, I would say, very enlightening and much needed discussion that is going on and deliberation that is going on, organized by NSRCL. Uh, I also want to compliment NSRCL for organizing uh, this session. And not only this, uh, but over the last several years, I know that you have been uh, actively promoting women entrepreneurship, women self-employment through a number of initiatives that you have been running. And I think that uh, augurs well, not only for the women in the areas that you are servicing, but also inspiring many other incubators across the country to take up similar causes. Um, I, on a lighter note, I'm surrounded by four women uh, on a daily basis in my life, my wife, my two daughters, and my mother-in-law, and they're highly empowered women. And so I would attribute much of my well-being, welfare, and wellness uh, to their empowerment. Uh, uh, they have self-empowered themselves more than I empowering them. And sometimes I feel that I mean, maybe I need a little empowerment in my house too. But that's on a lighter note. Uh, I do think there is a tremendous um, opportunity for women in India. And I think the government has been doing a number of initiatives related to that. I'd like to share uh, a few uh, pieces of information on that, because I think that would be very relevant to what we are talking about. Uh, after all, we are a country of 1.3 billion people. We have 1.4 million schools. We have 10,500 engineering and related institutions. We have 39,000 colleges. We have 150 million young students entering into the workplace. And as Mega remarked, we're going to have 400 million working women soon by 2030. Now, that represents a demographic dividend that we all can be very proud of. Uh, but at the same time, if we do not leverage and if we do not capitalize on the opportunities that women have in this world uh, to make a difference and to make an impact, it would be a great tragedy. And therefore, it becomes very important to see how do we create this ecosystem of empowerment for women, uh, an ecosystem where awareness about not only the opportunities, but the challenges that women face in the workplace are being continuously addressed by multiple stakeholders. It is not just the government which can do it. It's not just NGOs who can do it. Uh, you need society to come together. You need uh, colleges, educational institutions, state and local governments, and the private sector, and uh, all the other stakeholders to actively participate in this. It's not something that can happen just by wishing it to happen. And therefore, a number of actual initiatives have been uh, rolled out by the government, uh, which uh, some of which I've been very, very proud to be associated with, and which I will share a little bit because it shows uh, the, the capability and, and the potential that, that we have. As uh, I think Mega remarked, and as Hema also remarked, you know, how do we ensure three very important things when we talk of women empowerment? First, building awareness. Awareness means not only of the challenges that we have, because that's very important. If we don't address the challenges, we are not going to be able to fix the problem. This awareness about the opportunities that women have in today's technology-driven world. Technology has made uh, has become affordable, available, accessible, and advanced. Technology is now available for everybody to leverage, whether it is 3D printing, robotics, IoT, miniaturized electronics, or the jam trinity that the government has rolled out all across the country. Uh, the uh, Jandan bank accounts, which have been rolled out, uh, the Aadhaar ID, uh, unique ID, billion IDs, a billion mobile phones, uh, and a billion uh, smart accounts, uh, bank accounts have been rolled out. Now, how do we take advantage of all of this and create a slew of opportunities for self-employment, for entrepreneurship at a rural level, at a village level, at a tier two, tier three cities level? After all, we have 650,000 villages in our country. We have 715 districts. We have 8,000 small towns and cities. And we have only eight tier one cities uh, that people try to flock to and migrate in order to create their living and their livelihoods. Now, that's clearly an unsustainable uh, way of growing a country. Uh, our GDP may still grow at 8 to 10 percent, but are we carrying the entire people along? So that becomes the most important point. And therefore, the second part is the awareness that needs to be built through education. And the Atal Innovation Mission, for example, has launched thousands of what they call as Atal Tinkering Labs, which are actually innovation workspaces for young children between grade 6 to grade 12 to tinker with and, and play with the latest technologies that are shaping the world. 
Now, why is technology becoming important? It is becoming important because not only is it enabling you to reimagine a world with new entrepreneurial opportunities, but it's also enabling the digital reach that is required, whether you're in Sikkim or in Salem or in, uh, or in Jodhpur. Uh, how do you create products, maybe by the women community, by the rural uh, handicrafts uh, that, that Mega talked about? You know, how do we ensure that agripreneurs uh, are able to tap into this digital world and sell their products or services from Salem to Seattle, from Sikkim to San Francisco, or from Jodhpur to Japan? That is being enabled because of technology. And therefore, technology is going to play a very important role in transforming the way women are able to access the workplace and work in the workplace and enable them uh, to get empowered. Now, the second part is the empowerment part. When we talk about empowerment, that is one societal empowerment, which I think Hema and Mega very beautifully address in their talk. Uh, how do we empower them from a social construct point of view? You know, how do you make sure that all the barriers that we have uh, from a social point of view are being removed? And that requires active policies by the government that requires infrastructure to be enabled, empowering infrastructure so that women find a safe, secure workplace. And they also find the access to a global network of mentors, uh, particularly women mentors and success stories that are there. I mean, we have Falguni Nair, for example, uh, who has established the first unicorn in this uh, in this year? And India is a nation has the potential of a nation to become a nation of job creators, not just job seekers. Of that, we need you know only thirteen percent of the women are entrepreneurs today in our country, and we have fifty percent of our population as women. So how do we move that needle from thirteen percent to not just thirty five percent but to fifty percent? That is one of the things in main main thrust that. Uh, the uh, many government initiatives have also had. For example, in Adult Innovation Mission, beyond the 10,000 tinkering labs that we have set up, and, and I do want to remark that in these tinkering labs, 70% of the tinkering labs have been set up in schools, in government and government-aided schools, in the 715 districts that I talked about, not just uh, the uh, tier one districts. And second is 70% are in girls and co-ed schools. And so what did we find through these tinkering labs? we found an enormous appetite for the young girl child to take on these tinkering technologies and start creating innovations and have the potential to think themselves off as our potential entrepreneurs of the future. 45%, we run a marathon called an Atal Tinkering Marathon. This is an innovation marathon that is run every year. And out of this Atal Tinkering Marathon, 50,000 students in the last marathon participated. 45% of the winners were girl children. Now, that was not only a revelation for all the schools and the teachers and the parents uh, in, in the various schools, because the parents come to know that these are the innovations that are being created, but that has now set in a significant trend of a culture of innovation in our young girl students in the, in the, in the schools. And we have more than 4 million students. Uh, hopefully before the end of next two or three years, we will have more than 60,000, 70,000 adult tinkering labs, uh, which are being set up. The second part is we have launched uh, world-class incubators. More than 400 incubators today exist in India, and we have 55,000 startups. But what has been encouraging to us in the last four years is, in the Atal Innovation Mission, just like your incubator, which is an Atal incubator, uh, out of the 100 incubators which have been set up in community innovation centers, we have 33% as women entrepreneurs. That's a far call from the 13% women entrepreneurs that the country still averages. So that's a very encouraging sign. I think women are finding an opportunity and a safe environment and an enabling environment because this, you can empower, but how do you enable? The enabling happens through world-class incubators who can allow women entrepreneurs to set up. Now, I'm very proud that out of our incubators, there are about four of those incubators which are purely women-led incubators fostering women-led startups. For example, the one in Rajasthan, uh, AIC Banastali, the one A-Leap, uh, which is in Hyderabad. These are all women-led startups. And some of the women-led startups are doing extraordinarily fantastic job. Not only in, so there are two types of entrepreneurship. One is self-employment driven entrepreneurship, where for example, you enable the machinery, the technology, so that you have uh, in the rural areas, they are able to uh, do their own baking of goods. They are able to do food, you know, uh, uh, handicrafts, tailoring, robotic-based tailoring machines, and so on. 
many possibilities are there because of technology and therefore it is able to foster self employed women entrepreneurs on the other hand you have deep tech entrepreneurs whether it is in biotech healthcare it like how falguni has set up a workplace fashion workplace and so on that deep tech uh, entrepreneurship is also increasing now it is not amazing for me to see that you know you see a number of women graduating from from the various uh, schools and colleges but then after marriage many of them uh, settle down at home for various reasons either social reasons or other pressures and therefore they are not able to become entrepreneurs but today we are setting up the infrastructure through the community innovation centers more than 20 community innovation centers have been set up in india and these 20 communications uh, community innovation centers are set up in rural india tier 2 tier 3 cities that people will go and settle down now when you use those community innovation centers to foster your entrepreneurial skills and your capabilities and hubs of, you can have a hub and spoke mechanism through which uh, the hubs which are in various 715 districts if you have 715 hubs then the spokes uh, in the various other districts of that particular state get the benefit of innovation or feed innovation into the hubs now these are all the various ways in which we need to empower but i think the most important part in all of this is financial enablement how do you ensure you know we can talk about entrepreneurship but if you do not financially enable incentivize uh, and be able to provide seed funding and so on and so forth for these people to get the kick start that they need uh, even if you want to set up a small little shop a tailoring shop you need some investment and if you are setting up a large plant or a manufacturing plant or a biotech uh, organization you need that investment and that is where i think corporate sector has to step in very very actively i i feel in india there is a lot of initiatives that is i mean i have been i have come from the private sector i have worked for the tata group uh, and i have had the opportunity now uh, to work with the government for four years in this atal innovation mission what i find is that there is a lot that can be done by the corporates because they know the needs of the marketplace the government can enable the infrastructure the startup seed funding the incubators and so on but how do you make them successful in fostering world class entrepreneurs or world class startups is up to the corporate and private sector and as well as uh, the ngo organizations and organizations like the world bank and un who are able to help in the financing part uh, and make sure that they are able to uh, coast through now these are the various uh, uh, opportunities that we have and uh, of course i think three other things that i just want to say before i close how do you ensure mentors for the want to be wanna be women entrepreneurs and and women um, um, uh, potential uh, you know deep tech entrepreneurs or or startups that is a, an area where it is not just uh, women who need to play an active role in the mentorship because there is an automatic automatic success story that inspires the other women but the men who are involved in in this entire thing should be able to play a very important role and i think uh, we have been able to set up about 10000 mentors of change as we call uh, to all the atal innovation mission initiators and the benefit of that is clearly visible now for many of the women entrepreneurs because they are networked into a set of entrepreneurs who are not seeing who don't look at the gender part of it but who are seeing at the quality of the entrepreneurship or the startup and are able to help them the second is you also need to ensure that uh, there is a tremendous focus on being able to uh, the corporate you know the csr um, uh, contributions that are there how do we ensure that csr contributions play uh, an important role and are incentivized for women education women empowerment women startups and so on so that is i think um, not only a enabling policy but some corporate policies related to that uh, should be uh, ensured and and uh, finally um, i think there is a huge opportunity for uh, women entrepreneurs and uh, 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 women startups uh, to make a dent not only in india but across the world because everything in the world has to be reimagined from a sustainable development goals perspective whatever solutions we are having whether it is cars or uh, electricity or waste management and so on they all need the component of a sustainable development goal to go into reinnovating that product or that uh, particular sol solution or service and therefore there is a huge opportunity for women to participate in this revolution that is taking place across the world so with that uh, i stop and i i'd be very happy to open up uh, to any questions that are there 
So yeah, thanks a lot. I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so Hema, let me ask you a question, right? Um, so one of the things that I've noticed um, quite frequently when I interact with uh, women entrepreneurs is this feeling of guilt that comes up very rapidly. Uh, when I say that, um, it's like they, they keep telling me, you know what, I don't know if I'm worthy of coming to IAM because my venture, I'm not progressing as much. Uh, I see others who are going very fast. So um, I don't know um, if I should be doing this anymore. Right? I have to tell them, look, we have had thousands of people apply, a few, a few thousand submitted their business plans, and then we selected a few hundreds and you're in the top that we thought you should be here, right? So why should it not be a reward and why should it not be something that you should be proud of, rather feel guilty, right? And I've seen that quite often in terms like how do we construct recognition that people, uh, women will feel less guilty about or uses it as a currency to ward off some of the gravity that may be very quickly eroding around them. Right. I, I think uh, it's probably an issue with uh, what kind of role models they might have seen and also how it impacts their own self-esteem, right? And it's a question of, uh, do I feel that I, I should get it, right? So very often, in fact, I think uh, this ties in well with the 10,000 tinkering labs that uh, in the Atul mission. I mean, that sounds like a fantastic initiative, right? So from a young age, I think people need to be told, boys and girls need to be told that you can do it. And what you're get doing it is that uh, some of it, of course, not everything is also because of uh, your hard work and your effort and all of it, and that you deserve it, right? That you deserve to be here, structural reasons apart, because you've also put in a certain amount of work, right? I mean, how do you deal with it when you tell them? I mean, do you see this also going down over time? This sense of uh, guilt this time, or... sense of guilt. This time, I I was pretty smug about the program until I started talking to women who participated, right? And this had started telling me ways in which we have not been extremely inclusive. Like for instance, they said, "Look, not everybody has the same degrees of freedom." So exactly. when you when you are giving rewards to those who are running very rapidly, mm -hmm. that means you're not recognizing some of us for the kind of effort that we are putting in. Like, uh, so, so, so the reason why we are not running is not because we are unable to run, it's because the right. gravity around us is different. Right, right. That's what I am. Very hard that I was pretty smug that we had very good uh, startups this time around. But this got me to a point where he says, like, how do we look at these rewards? Like, Mega, like, any thoughts on that? Like, how do we ensure that we reward the effort and so recognize the effort and give rewards to those who are running very rapidly, but also recognize the fact that you are putting in a lot of work and we appreciate that. So I think there is a there is there is a mix there, right, um, Professor? There is, um, you know. I, I'm conflicted on this and I'll tell you why. I think on the one hand, there is a, we may not agree with it, but there is a reality of the workplace, of the capitalist workplace, right? Like I said, we may not agree with it, right? I, there's several parts of it that I don't agree with it, which, um, but I still think once you decide to participate in it, you need to find your ways to come to terms with it. Now, there are multiple ways of, of getting to it. Um, I think there are so so that's one that's one reality that we all need to find and and in many ways you know I'll say I don't know if this is controversial or not but I think the rules of capitalism were, were not written by women right let let me just put it out there right so every time someone rewards speed someone rewards the fact that hey I'm on the road all the time you know that 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 wasn't written that rule wasn't written by a woman but it's a rule it's a rule nevertheless right I need to find a way to achieve those outcomes by somehow bypassing that rule but that that rule is there right my awareness of it just the awareness of it is something i need to i i have to have the awareness of it now i think a very tactical way of addressing this would be there are multiple ways to define what a great business looks like right one of the conversations i've had with entrepreneurs right who are in they are what what i call in a very valuable but a very linear business 
it's a very linear business right it is a you, you can you can only increase it in a certain way but it's a very valuable and a very and a very solid business idea right i i urge the entrepreneur to put down their goals for what good looks like are you building a unicorn or are you building a sustainable business may not be unicorn but it's you know it's a it's a i have high quality relationships with my customers and i'm able to be profitable by year 3 they're very different paths if you're going to build a unicorn right then it's the speed then we all know the rules of the game it's the speed with which you with which you scale that matters but that's not the only great business i think a lot of us especially in the urban setup have equated startup success with multiple rounds of funding and getting to ipo very soon that's that's not the only there are some i i last week i got in touch with somebody who is the md of a family owned business that i'd never heard of the business is massive it's massively profitable i'd never heard of that business either and it took generations to build it up that is a very viable path as well so so very often these conflicts come in when we are constantly facing a single dimension of success right and i don't mean i you know so i i'm not necessarily saying that is tantamount to rewarding effort right rewarding effort to me is a slightly different thing but i think there is progress in multiple ways and very often we fall prey and sometimes the environment that we work in dictates the yardstick of success to us and there in you know but if you're creating an if you're running an incubator right i guess there are just to to expand the dimensions of success right and and i can give you a a, a private workplace uh, parallel right the, i think we all agree that one of the biggest uh, or the most prevalent yardsticks of success in uh, the corporate workplace is time to promotion right time to um, you know time to your next compensation that's a great that, that's a that's a that's a great um, uh, yardstick for wh- whoever wants to achieve it but there are you know we are now increasingly celebrating things slightly you know people want to define their own time to promotion but instead invest in your relationships invest in your in, in the quality of your portfolio because that time for you know 3 years to the next level was determined by somebody who lived in a different time in a different world they made different choices right now it you have to chip away at it i think that's a very it's a but it's 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 a very common problem that we see um i think we just need to expand the various measures of success but at the same time also remind ourselves of the you know some of the uh, the the notions that that prevail in the workplace whether that's in the entrepreneurial ecosystem or in the you, like i said we can choose not to agree with them but to wish them away is a slightly different thing right like there's uh, it it only it only disadvantages me if i just dismiss them right or i wish them away i need to be aware of them and 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 try to find my model uh, you know by being aware of those no i i i i i think um, what you're saying is true but for those of us who are running women incubators we probably should create a slight portfolio or categorize them saying that look you run to the pace that you are comfortable with but as you rightly said we have certain criteria so we will reward these people but we will also put you up we will mentor you we will do whatever we we'll probably start to look at a larger portfolio of rewarding that is like a cv point for them which yeah. works as a legitimacy because a lot of this plays a very legitimizing role in the society right that i got through incubator and i am is a legitimizing uh, uh, uh data point i got 50000 from i am is a legitimizing point right so yeah. we we'll have to figure that out but you are right but the laws of the land will be clearly indicated but probably in our uh, mentoring and our uh, signaling we should also start to be more pluralistic in terms of uh, recognizing the amount of effort that each is putting and sometimes the horizons of the ventures are also could be very long right not- I, i think that's a very important point right professor which is very often i, I was speaking with one of the most uh, you know one of the most prominent um, entrepreneurs in india a woman and i was having this conversation with her and she said look the returns will be the same the horizon will be different 
because I'm building something which is different. I'm building something which doesn't immediately strike. And, you know, stepping back, we all have to think about how many great companies were created in five years. It takes years, right? So I think that perspective is really important. We're all right now being you know, taken in a direction that the narrative is taking and we need to sort of, you know, step back and say, okay, what does it take to build a great business? And there are multiple yardsticks of six, multiple measures of success and the rewards can be, you know, I agree, you could sort of you know, think of alternate rewards as well. So I have one question for you, Mr. Ramanan, that has always been bothering me first time that I've gone to Delhi. Is that our um, fascination for this construct Hello. I think Professor froze. Yeah, it looks like he froze, right? <laughs> uh, Suresh. Yeah, you're back. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Raman, I just wanted to ask you like this absolute fascination for unicorns and that. To make, that to me is going to muddy the water a bit, especially given how pluralistic entrepreneurship is and problem solving is. And we should probably enable everyone to solve problems at a scale that they're comfortable with. So, so, so how do you suggest that we change this narrative a bit? So, uh, um, you know, there's a very in, uh, interesting question that you have posed and I have some very um, uh, personal views on that which I would like to share. First, I think recognition should always come in the form of further empowerment and further enablement. That is real recognition, not just saying that, you know, you've become a unicorn and you've got, got a funding, et cetera, et cetera. How is recognition going to incentivize that person towards furthering their interest and their goal towards becoming self-empowered, self-employed, self-enabled? Because we are talking about 1.3 billion people. We are talking about 50% of them being women. Now, you cannot expect that all 50% of the women are going to become entrepreneurs and create unicorns and so on and so forth. So that narrative is good for maybe 10% of, of the women entrepreneurs who are getting into the startup world and the entrepreneurial world. How do we ensure that the remaining uh, who are there in, in the system are being empowered and are being encouraged and are being enabled? So true recognition of any of the efforts and true recognition of women's uh, success stories would imply and should imply that they are further enabled and they're further empowered. Now, what do we mean by further empowerment and further enablement? From my point of view, this is where uh, the multiple stakeholders have to step in, in order to see that in their journey, how are we going to facilitate the journey even further into whatever they are pursuing? whether it is the rural woman uh, who is an agripreneur or somebody who is creating uh, food, uh, or value adding food products, uh, or someone who is looking at waste management and circular economy and so on and so forth. And today we have one big advantage which has been proven. You know, we have been all operating work from home for the last two, two and a half years due to COVID-19. And COVID-19 has unleashed an unprecedented wave of innovations of how do we enable digital workplace and enable this digital reach uh, to, to fill the various gaps that we have been having in our system. Not that it didn't exist before. I mean, not that this technology didn't exist before, but this stark need for overcoming the crisis uh, has generated a number of solutions and a number of proofs, proof points that you can, uh, you know, digitally empower the women as well as enable them a global reach. And I think this sort of, uh, this has to be taken up uh, in at a very serious note across, uh, not only by organizations and corporates, uh, for example, the Tata Group uh, has a, uh, you know, second, uh, second uh, life for the women uh, sort of scheme, where after, you know, they have worked and they have married and they have settled down at home, uh, how do you bring them back into the workplace, but using work from home and digital empowerment uh, for them? So that's the sort of thing that we need to enable. And this recognition has to be, of course, you know, when we have uh, our recognition for all the utter tinkering girls, uh, what do we do that? We ensure that they get a chance to work with the incubator and your incubator has also supported that. They get a chance to work in your incubator to see uh, how they can progress further. 
Now that two months stint or a three months stint in your incubator working with various startups opens up their imagination and allows them to think of new possibilities. So, uh, of course, you know, and and as Mega rightly mentioned, the 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 yardstick cannot be you want to become a successful startup and you want to be a unicorn. There are so many ways in which you are benefiting your family, your little society, your little village uh, where you're there. And how do you empower them uh, through this recognition at a district level, at a state level, at a national level? So we do a number of recognition events, which are non-financial. But I think that is that goes a long way. Uh, for example, if how do you get a, give a, a toolkit or a further financial kit for a young entrepreneur who has started showing uh, that they are capable of innovating and they are capable of running uh, their own shop. That is what we need to enable. And that's where the corporates uh, also can play a very, very big role. Okay. I guess suddenly realize that time is up. Uh, we certainly had a very interesting conversation. Um, I guess the road is very long. Uh, we need to change a lot of things. There certainly can't be development without uh, more inclusive. Uh, all of us are trying our own experiment. I just wish we will have more success, more women taking up ventures, um, various ways in which we could enable uh, this to happen. Right? So thank you very much, uh, Hema, Mega, and Mr. Ramana. It's been great uh, talking to all of you. Wonderful points, extremely, I'm sure, um, uh, illuminating for many of us. Thank you. Thank you, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I think uh, Hema and Ramanan. Thank you, Mekha and Ramanan. Yeah. I think next time we should make this longer. I feel like I have a lot of questions to ask. <laughs> All right. Maybe bye. We can convert this into a series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.